Muslim scholars have been telling Muslims for a long time that the Quran has been perfectly and miraculously preserved. Yasser Qadi had a slightly modified position. Those of us who study know that's total nonsense. You've got this myth that's been spread and Muslims believe it because their leaders are telling them perfect preservation. But who are you gonna listen to as a Muslim? The Christians who are criticizing your views or your leaders who are defending your views? Praise the Lord, David. It's so excited to be able to talk to you about the just Islam as a whole. But recently, there's been so much controversy, I believe from the June 6th, I want to say, uh, discussion, we can say, um, with Muhammad Ijab and Yasser Qadi regarding what we're calling the holes in the narrative. And I know at this conference you've brought that up a lot. And I think that some people have no idea what you mean by that, you know. And I think it'd be a great, just an opportunity to share what on earth are the holes in the narrative and who's Yasser Qadi and Muhammad Ijab. Yeah, so those were actually Yasser Qadi's words. He's the one who said there are, there are holes in the narrative. Um, and so Sheikh Yasser Qadi, one of the uh, most prominent Muslim scholars in, in recent history, and he's talking to Muhammad Hijab, who's more of a uh, popular Muslim apologist on, online. And what's happened over the, past, um, in, over the past few years is that uh, some myths have been breaking down. And it's, it's, it's awesome to watch because Muslim scholars have been telling Muslims for a long time that the Quran has been perfectly and miraculously preserved right down to the letter from the time of Muhammad. Uh, Yasser Qadi had a slightly modified position. He said it's been perfectly preserved from the time of the Caliph Uthman. So he's been saying perfect preservation, no difference anywhere in any Muslim uh, manuscript in the entire world. Now, those of us who study Islam, no, that's total nonsense. It's according to their own sources, that's total nonsense. Their sources talk about entire chapters coming up missing because Muslims were too lazy to recite them. Uh, talks about large passages coming up missing because the only people who had those passages memorized died in battle. Talks about verses being eaten by a sheep, all kinds of things, right? And then you have the people who actually look at the manuscripts and they can show all kinds of differences in the manuscripts, uh, corrections, uh, erase, erasings and things like that. Um, and then you have, in addition to all of that, you have different, different versions of the Quran that are used in different parts of the world today. So you can go to a place in Africa that will use a different Arabic text of the Quran from what they use. And this isn't, this isn't, a, um, you know, pronunciation differences or something like that. They have different Arabic words. And so what happened is you've got this myth that's been, that's been spread for a long time, and Muslims believe it because their leaders are telling them perfect preservation right down to the letter. We've all been saying that's complete nonsense for years, but who are you gonna to listen to as a Muslim? The, the Christians who are criticizing your, your views or your, your leaders who are defending your views? Well, eventually people like Jay Smith and Hatun Tash started showing up to Speaker's Corner in London where Muhammad Hijab uh, does, does his dawah started showing up with different Qurans in Arabic, right? And putting them side by side and saying, look, this is different from this. This is a different word. And they're asking the Arabic speaker, Arabic speaking Muslims right there. What does that say? What does that say? And so this led to a kind of uh, crisis for a lot of people. And Muhammad Hijab still really believed perfect preservation right down to the letter, except for maybe some differences in dialect or pronunciation or something like that. It's got to be something simple, some easy explanation. And so he had Sheikh Yasser Qadi on his live stream and Sheikh Yasser Qadi, who, you know, 10 years ago was saying perfect preservation right down to the letter from the time of Uthman, realizes, hey, he's in a position now where this is becoming common knowledge among Western scholars and he works in those circles as well. And Qadi basically said, I don't want to talk about this. He repeated, I do not want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about this. We should not be having this conversation in public because he was put in a position if he says, um, oh, yeah, perfect preservation right down to the letter, he would be laughed out of academia by people who know, you know the reality of the situation. But if he says, okay, we've been wrong all these years, there've been all kinds of changes and so on, then he's gonna destroy the faith and confidence of Muslims. And so he really made it known that he didn't wanna talk about this, but Hijab, who's convinced that there must be some simple explanation, kept pushing. And Yasser Qadi said, look, I'm, I'm gonna say, basically um, the arguments we use and the explanations we come up with for these different versions of the Quran and so on, those work among Muslims, but as soon as we go to Western academics, they shoot those explanations full of holes. 
and we know their rights because they're quoting our own sources to us. And so he said, all I'm going to say is that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's all I'm going to say, right? And so he basically, I mean, it's a simple question. Is there one Quran? And he's, nope, there's holes in the narrative and the things we say don't, don't, would be destroyed by Western, Western academics. And so he basically told the entire community what we've been telling, what Muslims and Muslim apologists, Muslim scholars have been telling you for years. It was all complete nonsense, but I'm not going to solve this for you. And so there was an immediate backlash. We, we thought it was awesome. I mean, we, right then we had a lot of respect for Yasser Khadi. He was like, wait, he, he, he didn't lie. He did not, he did not lie there. So that is, that is awesome. We had a lot of respect for him uh, right there. But um, because of the backlash from Muslims, Muhammad Hijab deleted that portion of the discussion. Then Yasser Khadi had it, had it posted on his channel. He very quickly had to delete the, the comment section. He had to turn off comments because Muslims were saying, you're destroying my faith in the Quran. Then uh, Hijab took down the entire discussion and Yasser Qadi took down the entire discussion. But then Yasser Qadi started, f started uh, sending copyright complaints to YouTube to anyone who had quoted parts of it. Parts of that interview started sending, f and he know he's an academic, he knows you're allowed to quote other people's stuff for purposes of uh, criticism and education and so on. So he knows you're allowed to use clips of his material and so on, but he started sending false copyright complaints. So the little bit of respect that we, we had for him very quickly, that all shattered because he was so embarrassed and he's been so traumatized by this that, uh, you know, he's filing false copyright complaints to get this taken down because he's so embarrassed. And notice, notice the situation there. It's all because he spoke the truth on the, the problem. One time, one time, one interview, one Muslim scholar says, guys, we need to be honest. We get, there's some holes in what we're saying here. And backlash, silence him. His career's messed up forever. That's the response if you actually tell Muslims the truth about the Quran. And so that tells you how, what a sensitive issue it is. And it tells you, if you really want to shake the confidence of Muslims, it'd be good to learn some of that material and show them that, that, that there are holes in the narrative. And you know, you know, watching that, it was very interesting, as you said, Muhammad Hijab, it just keeps going, and it's almost like he was saying to this scholar, please help me, I, you know, please help me, and I don't have an answer for this, please help me, and he was all over the place. I thought that was really interesting, and you know, I was thinking about just for, you know, maybe some Christians, and I, and I saw that you mentioned this, uh, I believe last night in, in your speech, or on Friday night, and you talked about how, hey, I'm not just telling every Christian just go read the Quran, and just go read the whole Quran, because it won't make any sense, especially if you start reading from chapter one, <laughs> and then just go forth and think, oh, it'll all be chronological. But, you know, maybe if you had some text that you said, hey, just memorize these, these would be able to help you if you were engaging with a Muslim on the streets. Yeah, so it's basically there's, you know, where do you start and sort of how you, how you should proceed. Uh, if someone wants to read the Quran, great, but I've just seen too many people give up and then they, they give up their, their study of Islam because the Quran is a very, very difficult book to get through. It's, it's, all, it's, it's, it's a big mess. Worst book I've ever read, right? And I'm not just saying that because I disagree. It's the worst book I've ever read. It's, 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 it's terrible. But um, so anyway, it, it's very difficult to get through. And I'm not just saying that because I disagree with it. I mean, there, there are very interesting uh, you know, passages and so on in the Hadiths and the Sira literature and so on. So it's basically if someone's going to keep doing this long term, kind of a different approach than start off with the most, you know, some very difficult reading. Uh, so yeah, as far as just Christians in general, I think Christians in general, since, you know, we're going to be, you know, dealing with Islam for a long time, should learn a couple of verses of the Quran. And if I were to pick a couple, probably be uh, Surah 4, verse 157. That's a verse which says that um, Jesus wasn't crucified. He wasn't killed and wasn't crucified. And the very next verse says that Allah raised him up. So this is very important um, difference between Christians and Muslims. And the reason this is an important verse is, uh, you know, a lot of Christians aren't comfortable, you know, going after Muhammad or blasting away at the Quran or something like that. And, you know, you, you generally, unless someone's being a jerk, you don't want to come out guns blazing in, you know, every conversation, right? If someone's being a jerk, that's a different story. Um, but, you know, if you're having a friendly conversation with a, you know, Muslim coworker or another Muslim student or something like that, um, it's kind of a safer area to, of discussion, talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. And yet it allows you to really um, go into some problems because your average Muslim, your average Muslim, he thinks, ha, Christians believe that Jesus was crucified. How could this righteous man be crucified? And God lets this happen. That's so weird. Even though the Quran is filled, 
is filled with stories of prophets and so on being being killed and so on. Muhammad himself died because he was poisoned by a Jewish woman. So, but but what they're actually thinking in their heads is Christians have a horrible view. The innocent Jesus was killed, and so they're the average Muslim believes in a kind of uh, substitution theory where Allah took someone else, usually Judas and disguised Judas, made him look like Jesus, and, and Judas was crucified in Jesus' place. And they say, you see, in Islam, the guilty, evil person, Judas is crucified in Christianity, the innocent person? So what, what kind of God do you believe in, right? They think they have this, uh, you know, this uh, stronger, more just system here. But once you start, you know, pushing them a little bit more on that and getting them to think a little bit more deeply about that, wait a minute, the reason Christians today and pretty much everyone else besides Muslims believes that Jesus died on the cross is because Allah tricked everybody? Because that's their belief. Allah miraculously disguised someone else so that this other person was crucified. But Allah didn't, didn't let anyone in on that until Muhammad came along. By that time, everyone believed that Jesus died by crucifixion. So the, the, since Christianity couldn't get off the ground without that, that means that Allah is responsible for starting Christianity. And so you start getting into some of these, why did Allah start the largest false religion, according to him, in the, in the world? You know, why did he deceive so many people? What, what kind of God is, is this cosmic deceiver who tricks people into believing things for no, you know, believing false things for no reason and so on? Start getting into some of those. And notice, you're, you're kind of in a Christian realm, but you're, you're, you're really criticizing the Islamic view. So that's an important one. Surah 5, verse 47, another one. There are lots of verses in the Quran which, um, which say that the Jewish and Christian scriptures are as good as gold. The Quran, the Quran claims that our scriptures are inspired, preserved, and still authoritative, even now. So just a few verses earlier, Surah 5, verse 43, some Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute. And Allah's response is, why are they coming to you when they have the Torah? So according to Allah, they don't need you, Muhammad, they've got the Torah. It was the Arabs who needed Muhammad because they needed a revelation in their own language. That's the position of the Quran. So just a few verses later, chapter 5, verse 47, Allah commands Christians to judge by the gospel. And then the very next verse commands Muslims to judge by the Quran. So that's the actual picture of the Quran, which your average Muslim believes that Jews got their scriptures and corrupted it, Christians got their scriptures and corrupted it, and therefore Allah gave his final revelation of the Quran, and that's what everyone needs to read now. And the actual position of the Quran is that different people have their different books, they're all from Allah, and the Quran is for the Arabs. And so, but the reason that is so important, apart from, you know, kind of shattering that myth that Muslims uh, believe about, you know, the, the uh, complete uniqueness and the current status of the Quran, um, if, you, if you get into a conversation with a Muslim about anything, the deity of Christ, the, his death by crucifixion, the resurrection, they have to eventually say, when you can show it from, from the Bible, they have to be, they're going to have to say at the end of the day, your book's been corrupted. And if you say, wait a minute, your God says that I'm supposed to judge by my book. You're telling me not to judge by my book because it's been corrupted. Who should I listen to here? You or Allah? Because Allah says my book's good as gold. You say it's not. So who do I believe here? And you're kind of putting them in a problem. What the problem you're actually put, putting them in is we call it the Islamic dilemma. The Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of our book. But our book contradicts the Quran. So the two possibilities here, we either have the word of God or we, we've got something that's corrupt or something else. If we have the word of God, Islam is false because our book contradicts Islam. If we don't have the word of God, Islam is false because Islam affirms our book as the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. So if we have the word of God, Islam is false. If we don't have the word of God, Islam is false. Either way, Islam is false. This is what happens when your book affirms scriptures that contradict it. And so once again, that, that's kind of on a Christian issue, the, you know, the, the, the gospel and so on. And so you kind of on a safer, in safer territory than like blasting away at Muhammad. And so more Christians would be comfortable with that. And uh, so th that's kind of a good area. And finally, Surah 9, verse 29, which commands uh, Muslims to violently subjugate Jews and Christians. And that would just be helpful in terms of, you know, if, if a Muslim is ever telling you, hey, you know, terror has nothing to do with Islam, violence against other groups has nothing to do with Islam, just a good way to get the conversation going. And so that would kind of be Christians in general should at least learn a couple of things along those lines. And then Christians who want to you want to focus more on witnessing the Muslims or uh, refuting Islam or something like that uh, can go deeper. And I would suggest kind of studying topically, pick a topic you're interested in, you know, find a good article on that, then go to the Muslim sources and what they say about that topic, master that topic, um, keep doing that until you've got all the main topics covered, uh, learn uh, the most common Muslim arguments for Islam, learn the most common Muslim 
objections to Christianity, be prepared for those. And, and then somewhere down the line, yeah, sit down and read through the, the entire Quran. But you got to be really, really motivated to get through that. Yeah, I think that that's really cool. And I like how you said this is my, you know, if this is your co-worker or something. And something I remember watching an interview you did, I believe, with Cameron Bertuzzi, where he, he brought out a situation, maybe uh, more or less of polemics and how to address people. And I believe it, it speaks to the nature of being all things to all people. And you had mentioned, I believe it was debates, and correct me if I'm wrong, with William Lane Craig. And you were watching it, I think, with your late friend, Nabil Qureshi. And his reaction to the debate kind of surprised you. And I thought that was very really interesting. I'd love for people to hear kind of what, that, what that's like and what polemics is in being all things to all people. Yeah, so that, that was a long time ago. This is when Nabil was still a Muslim. And we, we would get together and watch de debates, sometimes live. Like we went and watched uh, Mike Lacona debate, Shabir Ali. Uh, but we would also watch videos of debates. And we were watching um, William Lane Craig debate Jamal Badawi. And that was one of the most one-sided debates I've ever seen. Craig absolutely crushed everything Badawi said. Badawi couldn't answer anything Craig said. By the time, but you know, towards the end of the debate, Badawi is getting so desperate and flustered that he starts yelling and so on. And so you're looking at this as a, as a Western Christian and you're thinking, wow, you're losing. You know you're losing. That's why you're getting desperate. That's why you're, you're, you're yelling. And so we finish and I go, I would have scored the debate like 95-5 or something like that. So we finished and I said, so Nabil, what'd you think? And he goes, ah, but we clearly won. I said, what, what, what were you just watching, right? So I understand there are people who just side with their guy. Nabil's not like that. Nabil's a really smart guy. He's a trained communicator and so on. So what in the world was he seeing? And it took me a long time to kind of get it out of him, what, what it was. But what it was is um, from, from his background, when someone is actually yelling and stuff like that. It's because he's passionate, because he's so confident that he's, he, he's right, because he has such good reasons for what he believes. And so this comes out as a kind of righteous anger against someone who's blaspheming. Craig is all calm because deep down he doesn't even believe what he's saying. He knows, he knows it's false. And so he can't even get excited about it. And so we're looking at this going, Craig is calm because he, he knows he has nothing to worry about. He's dominating. Badawi is yelling because he's desperate and flustered. Nabil was looking at it going, Badawi's yelling because he's so passionate, because he has the truth, and Craig is calm because deep down he, he doesn't even believe what he's saying. So completely different uh, perspective. And then I, I, I thought that was Nabil at first. And then eventually I started realizing as I went out, you know, debating and so on, when I'm starting to give information about, you know, Muhammad and having sex with a prepubescent girl and things like that, well, you're looking down in the front row and you see these nice little old Muslim ladies and stuff like that. You don't want to be just blasting away at them. And so I present it very, you know, meekly and stuff like that. And it's okay, this, this is a debate. So I have to present this information, but I'll just say, and I'll present it all meekly like that. And Muslims would walk out of there, ha ha, he's so weak and so on. So they, they just weren't impressed. And then, uh, it was, you know, I was, it was a few debates into, you know, the, the debates I've done. And finally I said, look, just start blasting with this stuff. And so I gave the exact same information. And, but I was like, how can you believe in this stuff? Look at what he did. And they walked out of there, you know, oh, he's destroying our faith. And I'm like, that's what you're, you're looking at more how I'm saying something than, than what I'm saying. And basically over time, I've realized there's, there's just this problem in that so many Christians I run into and so many Christians I encounter online, they tell me, David, you're doing it all wrong. You should just talk about Jesus. Don't ever criticize Muhammad. Don't ever criticize the Quran. That's just going to drive them away. And I have no clue what planet they're living on. I talk about Muhammad and the Quran all the time. Muslims can't stay away, right? It actually draw it actually draws them in. And so, I mean, th th this was I mean, this is actually a <laughs> this is one of the, probably my favorite story of all time. Um, I got contacted by because uh, I get these all the time. David, you're doing it wrong. And I'll just point out, I'll say, well, well, look at all these testimonies of Muslims who became Christians after watching my videos. What, you know, what's going on there? Um, but one guy contacted me, said, David, you know, you, you present good information, but the way you present it is, you know, horrifying. You're just going to drive Muslims away. And I was like, yeah, my experience tells me something different. And he goes, well, you should be more like Jesus. And, and I said, so I responded, I go, you mean more like, you know, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, you whitewashed tombs, you brood of vipers. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk to Muslims like that, man. Don't, don't try to get me to talk like that. And he goes, well, he can talk like that because he's Lord. You should be more like one of the apostles in the new Testament. And I said, 
you know, okay, so I should, you're saying I should be more like the Apostle Paul who said to Elymas the sorcerer, you, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, because I'm not going to go around calling Muslim sons of the devil and enemies of righteousness. That's mean, dude, right? And he says, well, well, yeah, okay, so, but they're, in the Western context, you know, you're going to reach more people being nice than by throwing stuff in their faces. And I said, do, do you think Muslims are more like the ancient world? I mean, Muslims, especially from over, do you think they're more like that? Or do you think they're more like you? And he goes, look, it's just a fact. And so we, we, we kept going back and forth. And I said, look, all my experience tells me the way I'm doing it, that's what they pay attention to. That's when you get them listening. That, and when they're, once they're listening, that's when they leave Islam. And uh, so finally he said, look, there's a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. It's about a guy named Nabil who had a Christian friend who just loved him for years until he converted. You need to read that book so you can be more like that Christian. I go, I thought he was joking at first, right? I said, well, are you joking? You know, that's me, right? <laughs> that's me in the book that you're, you're talking about. And, he go, and then he responded, he goes, oh, no, I didn't know that. And I go, what are the odds that out of everyone in the world you could tell me to be like, you just told me to be like myself so I could be more effective in reaching Muslims? And he said, it was hilarious. He goes, wow, now I feel like I just tried to tell William Lane Craig about the Kalam cosmological argument. <laughs> and uh, so, but, but, but that's the idea. And, um, it, you know, again, I, I, I got this through experience of interacting with Muslims. Christians, especially in the West, can't get their minds around the idea that some people just don't think like them. And some people respond, respond and react to things differently. And it's, it's, I mean, you got two ways. You can say one, it, do, it just doesn't work and therefore you shouldn't do it, but it, 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 it does work. It, it, it's, I mean, the, the people right now in the world who are most, most successful in seeing and getting Muslims to leave Islam and then to explore the options, the people who are most successful there are people who are blasting away at Islam. Um, so there's that. The other question is, is it biblical? And biblically, they just had different, different ways of interacting with different people. Yeah. If you were, if you were a, an oppressor or something like that, Jesus was coming in blazing at you, right? If you were an oppressed person, he didn't come like that. And so the, the idea that, you know, we, we should never hurt anyone's feelings or something like that, I have no idea what that came up, where that came up with. Jesus heard all kinds of feelings. Uh, Paul heard all, there's a reason these guys are getting killed, right? So yeah, and the, the other thing, one, one, one last point is um, Nabil, just because I mentioned that there are Christians who say, you know, you shouldn't go after their book. You should just focus on, you know, preaching, preaching Jesus and things like that. It's the most common thing I get. But Nabil uh, told me after he became a Christian, he said, you know, when we were going through the arguments for the reliability of the New Testament and, um, you know, the, the historical evidence for the Jesus' death and resurrection and, uh, you know, talking about why Christians believe Jesus is Lord. When we're going through those, I was actually thinking Christians actually have good reasons for what they believe. But I was also thinking, but I have better reasons for Islam. And therefore, even if they can show me with 99% certainty that all these things are right, I'm still 100% sure that Islam is true. And that's a kind of confidence that Muslims have been fed all their lives. They're taught, hey, there's such great evidence for Islam and there, there, there are no problems with Islam. So you can have 100% confidence in Islam. Anything else comes along, you don't need to take it seriously. And therefore, in, if you want them to take any alternative seriously, you kind of have to shake that 100% confidence. And only, I would say upwards of 90, 95% of everyone, I, every Muslim I've ever seen who left Islam and came to Christ, it was only after having their faith shaken. And so when people start saying it as a general rule, don't go after their book, don't go after their prophet. I think that's very dangerous. If someone wants to say, hey, me personally, I just like to focus on, on Jesus. I say, great, there, there are different kinds of Muslims, there are different kinds of people, and there are different kinds of uh, kinds of approaches. But when someone just starts laying it down as a rule, I, don't, I think they don't really know what they're talking about. Yeah, hey man, I think that's a really good point. Uh, the, just the last question I, I think would be great for maybe people that don't understand when it comes to the doctrine of salvation for us as Christians versus what it would be for a Muslim and how they would enter into paradise. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's a little tricky. Muhammad himself said, I do not know what Allah will do with me. <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know what, I, so this is, this is, this is Muhammad, the greatest of all the great ones. And he says, I, I can't really tell you that what Allah will do with me. So it's basically in Islam, 
the highest relationship you can have with Allah is a slave to master relationship. The Quran condemns anyone for calling Allah father or anything like that. Um, the, you can only have this slave to master relationship. And so you're either a good slave or a bad slave. And as a slave, you hope that you're good enough that Allah will love you and reward you. Whereas in Christianity, we're children of God, right? And anyone who's, who's, got, who's got kids, you, you know, you, you, you automatically love your kids, right? It's not, oh, my child has to first earn my love. If you were to have a slave, you wouldn't automatically love the slave. You would wait and see if it's a good slave or a bad slave. And so that's what happens in, in Christianity and Islam, right? We, are, we love God because God first loved us, right? God loved us first. In Islam, you love Allah first and you have to obey him and do what he says. And then eventually he might start loving you because you're such, you're such a good slave. But what that means is, I mean, how do, you, how do you know with your finite knowledge if you've kind of earned Allah's love? And you, you kind of never do. And so you have a couple of guarantees that if you die while waging jihad for Allah or something like that, you go to paradise. Other than that, you just don't know. So there's no assurance of salvation in Islam. And that's part of the reason we have lots of, uh, lots of jihad attacks and so on. These are people who are getting kind of desperate. One of the things that has been interesting is, uh, especially you know, a few years ago, there were attacks in Paris and stuff. And they started talking about um, the backgrounds of the Muslims, because they wanted to show it has nothing to do with Islam. And they started, sh started showing, well, these weren't good Muslims growing up. They went to clubs and they did all this stuff and they did bad things. So we can't take them seriously as Muslims. But if you understand the Muslim sources, no, that makes perfect sense. These are people who know they, they sinned a lot and therefore they don't know when, once they start getting more serious about the religion, they don't know if their good deeds are going to somehow outweigh those bad deeds unless they they die while waging jihad and then they have a guarantee. And so these are people who they believe their salvation is in total jeopardy because of things they've done in the past. And the only way out of that is jihad. And so you get the attack and so it has everything to do with Islam. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense when you think of the Pulse nightclub shooter because a lot of the rumors, well, he was homosexual. He wasn't really practicing Islam. But then, you know, months later, we get the recording that comes out. I did this for Allah. Don't ask me any questions. <laughs> but very interesting. I want to thank you for your time, David. It's just been excellent. I'm really excited for people to get this information out, man. All right. Thank you. Praise the Lord, bro. <laughs> Thanks, brother. That was awesome.